How many verses? 12 through 21? What's that? Nine, ten verses? Nine verses? Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 21. And we are taping this? Is where we're at today. We got, after today, we have two more weeks. And then I will be going with my family to Utah for Lorena's brother's wedding. Okay, you're so. not converting then. <laughs> That's, That's not really, is it? Okay. I might have been talking while the thing was on. You got to no. delete that. <laughs> All right, let's oh. pray and uh, commit it to the Lord. Father, thanks for today. Thanks for bringing us here, Lord. Uh, would you just meet us in this place, speak to our hearts this evening, Lord, and we just, we trust that the things that you show us, we're going to put into practice. So go before us. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we have been talking in Philippians chapter 3. We've been seeing Philippians chapter 3 is pretty much the entire thing is Paul's testimony. And so the in, uh, in verses 1 through 11, we've seen Paul's past, his history, where he's been. You know, him coming to the Lord and what that looked like in his life. And so here... Uh, this next little portion is divided into two sections. 12 through 16 is Paul's present. How does converting to Christ affect you in the present? What are your goals? And we're going to see that there's going to be five essentials for following Christ in the present. And then verses 17 through 21, we're going to see the hope of the future. What is the future of anyone who's following the Lord? And so as we look at this this morning, um, we're really going to... What? Evening. This evening? Yes. <laughs> Sorry. She's, she's really good. She catches me on all these things, Troy. <laughs> As we look at it this evening, so how does encountering Jesus change us in the present? That's the first question that we're going to ask. We're going to see five different things in these first couple of verses. And so in verse 12, it says this, Not that I have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. The very first thing, right off the bat, that we see, if we're one of the essentials in living for Christ in the present, is to have this attitude of you're not satisfied with where you're at. What does Paul say right here? He says he is evaluating himself. He says, not that I have already obtained this. What is the this? Well, you go back up to verse 11, and it's that he may attain the resurrection from the dead. He's, he, what he's saying is, I haven't attained the resurrection from the dead. I'm not made perfect yet. I'm still a work in progress. Paul evaluates himself by comparing himself to who? Someone who has resurrected from the dead. Somebody who is perfect and who is the only person that he knows that's done those things? Jesus, Jesus Christ. And so what we see is Paul is evaluating himself, comparing himself to Christ Jesus. So often, I think, what do we do? Who do we compare ourselves to? Other people. Our next door neighbor. Yeah. Our next door neighbor. Look at my next door neighbor. You know what? They're kind of running a race. I'm not sure what race they're running. They might be running a different race than I'm running because my skill and superiority in running this race is much more oh evident God. than our neighbors. We compare ourselves to those who, one, are either we feel that they're way more spiritual than us or we feel that they're nowhere close to where we're at. And so if we compare ourselves to others, it brings us to one place. It brings us to the place of satisfaction. We become satisfied with where we're at. And so what we see, the first thing is we can, the first thing we need to look at and say is we can't be satisfied. There's this, this holy dissatisfaction in our lives. We can't be satisfied with where we're at. The only way to not be satisfied with where you're at is to compare yourself to Jesus Christ. That's the only way to not be satisfied. And so what does Jesus say about being satisfied? Turn with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a hard one. Zephaniah, which is one of the last minor prophets. It's right before Matthew. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 12. Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 12. It's after Habakkuk. Habakkuk, Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 12. This is what Jesus says. This is what God says through Zephaniah. It says, at that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps. So he's taking lamps and he's searching through Jerusalem. Zephaniah 1.12. At that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the men. Do you notice what he says? I'm going to punish those guys in Jerusalem who are complacent. Who are sitting there satisfied with where they're at. And what do these guys say? These, they say in their hearts, the Lord's not going to do good, nor will he do ill. So these guys, they're, they're satisfied where they're at. 
God's not going to do any good. God's not going to do any ill. God's just there. I'm just here living my own life, comparing myself to the others around me. Doesn't matter. I'm satisfied with where I'm at. Paul says this, don't be satisfied where you're at. Stop comparing yourself to others and start comparing yourself to Jesus Christ. Why? Why do we compare ourselves to Jesus Christ? Because we need to make this our own. We're gonna, we need to press on and make it our own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. We belong to Jesus. And so the, what we see is we don't compare ourselves to others. We compare ourselves to the person who made us his own, Christ Jesus. And we're going to compare ourselves with him. And Paul feels this so strongly. Now look at, in verse 13, he repeats himself. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. He says, I'm not there yet. I mean, we can probably think of people that we really look up to in the Christian community. They're still a work in progress. I don't care who. I mean, you look up to Pastor Chuck. We'll just use him as an example. Everybody looked up to Pastor Chuck. He was an amazing man of God. Mm -hmm. But he was still a work in progress, even until the day he died. He told until... us that routinely. He, was really... <laughs> yeah. he did. That he was, he's a work in progress. And so he says, brothers, I'm just a work in progress. I haven't made this my own. So the first thing we see is that we're not satisfied with where we're at. The second thing we see is right here. But one thing I do, the second essential for the present following of the Lord is to have a devotion to God. We need to have a single-minded purpose in that we are going to follow the Lord. I'm going to do one thing. What's that one thing? I'm going to follow God. One thing I'm going to do. Notice what he says. Probably... Here's, his, here's the key verse for Paul's life. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. What does it mean to forget what lies behind? That's just, I'm just going to forget everything I've ever done and all of this, that, and the others. That's not what it means. Forgetting what lies behind means this. It means we're no longer going to be influenced or affected by past failures and past successes. Past failures and past successes aren't going to influence our present decisions. I'm going to work just as hard, regardless of if I had a failure in the past or if I had a success in the past. I'm not going to rest on a success, nor am I going to let a failure define my present. It's a mistake. I'm going to move on from it. Can you think of someone in the Bible, someone in the Bible who did not let past circumstances affect present decision making? We didn't talk Moses. He killed, you know, somebody, and then he defied everybody, and he took off. That's one. I'm sure there's better ones. There's well, better uh, ones. Job. Job. <clears throat> he didn't let any of. I mean, his whole family died. Mm -hmm. He didn't let the past. I mean, those were huge failures. All his stuff was stolen. <laughs> his friends were terrible. They were. Lot was going to give his daughters to the homosexuals. <laughs> yeah. I mean. <laughs> Talk about some interesting... The Bible's full of people who didn't let their past failures define their present condition. Probably the best one. I'm going to give you the best one. Turn with me. We're going to read a story. Genesis chapter 45. We're going to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 45. And look, I just opened straight there. Genesis 45. <coughs> you guys are going to love this story. Genesis 45. You guys know this story by heart. I already know. As soon as you turn there and look at it, you're like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then Joseph could not control himself before all who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out for me. So no one stayed with him. When Joseph made himself known to his brothers, he wept aloud. The Egyptians heard it. The household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father so alive? His brothers couldn't answer. They were, what does he say right there? Dismayed. Why were they dismayed? Because. What's the history here? They thought he was dead. Why? Because they threw him in a pit. And then what? And then they sold him into slavery. They sold him into slavery! Talk about past mistakes. Talk about past difficulties and trials. Have any of us gone through what Joseph went through? A slave. And then what happened when he was a slave? He got falsely accused. Falsely. And not, I mean, he's not just accused of a crime, but he's falsely accused of a crime. He's put in prison for life. I mean, is there any hope for this guy? There's no hope for this guy. And so what does he say? His brothers are dismayed. They're like, oh my gosh, you're alive and you're the ruler of Egypt. You're going to kill us. Because what would you do to your little brothers or your older brothers? Oh, 
there would be some words and a little lording over them, perhaps, that's going on. Advantages. <laughs> are, uh, you know? Yeah. You, you put yourself in Joseph's place. So, yeah. Joseph, what does he say? So, Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near, and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you to preserve life. Here you have this example of what Paul is talking about. Joseph's forgetting the past, the past failures, the past successes. He's forgetting all of those things because he understands that he's going to press towards the goal. That God has a purpose, even through failures, even through successes. He's not going to dwell on those and let it define who he becomes, but he's going to trust the Lord. He's going to press on towards the goal. And so we see one of the greatest examples, that this man forgot what lied behind. He strained forward to what lied ahead, even though at times... It must have seemed like an impossibility that this was never going to happen. How is the Lord going to do this? I don't know. There's times when you look at your present situation and you might think, well, it's an impossibility for the Lord to do anything. But that's usually when the Lord does amazing things. Because here's what we're going to see. What are we pressing on? What are we pressing towards? He says, I'm straight. So, so we had the first two things, right? We had, we're not satisfied. The second thing, we have this devotion to God. The third thing we see, that we we're all have the same direction. We're all going the same way. Anyone that's following the Lord in the present has the same direction. We're all straining toward what lies ahead. And what lies ahead? Well, look at what he says right here, verse 14. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Woo! That's big couple things we got to notice here. First thing is we've got our fourth point. Our fourth point is that we need to be determined. We're going to press ahead and we need to be determined to press ahead. We're not going to let anything stop us in pressing ahead. There has to be this determination that it's the same idea that we are determined to win. Whatever it's going to cost, we're going to pay that price because we are determined to press on. We're determined to go towards the goal. We're determined to win the prize. But what is the prize? We see it right here. The prize is the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's some great language, but what is the prize? There's a verse that tells us the prize. 1 Corinthians 2.9. Who's going to read it for us? Lorena's looking. 1 Corinthians 2.9. I feel like Bible. What is that? Just draw your swords. Stuck today. Sword. I think it's like sword drill. Sword drill. I think Gerald is going to beat you to it. Yeah, my Bible's all Oh, here we go. But it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, nor mm. have entered into the heart of man. For these things we try to prepare for those who love him. Is your eye has not seen. Mm. Your ear heard. hasn't heard. Your heart. What does it say about the heart? I've entered, never entered into the heart of man. We can't even comprehend the prize that we're going for. I mean, what's the best prize you can win on this earth? Mm. Just think. What's the best prize? What would be the prize if you could win any prize on this oh. earth? What prize would you want? The Mega Lotto. I mean, if you wanted to go that <laughs> way, yeah, give me Mega that. Lotto. What are you going to get with the Mega Lotto? Horses. We're going to get a church. <laughs> church. <laughs> yes. We have a church. We're going to get a building. We're going to get a building. <laughs> you know, but if you notice those people that win the Mega Lotto, what happens to them? They die. Oh, yeah. so many of them are broke within ten years. <laughs> so many of them. Yeah. Because you you start understanding the prize that they're searching for the prize that they're going after is worthless yeah. well, like, i mean we can yeah. we can conceive of some bitty, pretty big prizes world championships i mean just in a couple days we're starting the world cup the biggest sporting event that the world ever sees <laughs> and it's only every four years it's my favorite sporting event ever world cup oh, yeah. it's in russia this year <laughs> but what do they get when you win you know what you get you get a little star on your jersey that's what you get. Soccer? It's football. Oh, it's football. <laughs> well, it's an American football. No, no it's, it's world football. But what do they get? They get a star on their jersey. That's it. You got a star. And pretty soon you're just in the pages of history. Nobody remembers. Wait, you get a star. You're, you get a star. And, you're, and you get a little trophy, but I don't even think you get to keep the trophy. It That's goes back. Sad. I mean, do you guys remember Joey Brand came to our church years ago, and he was the world, he, he won that Pipe Master World Champion, and they give him the, the prize, and he's like, yeah, I got the prize, and then it starts raining, and they're like, give us back that prize, because it's raining, you don't even get to keep it, he had the prize for like five minutes, and it starts raining, they take the prize away, and everybody runs off the beach, and he's just standing there in the rain, like, what did I, what just 
happen. I just, I'm the best surfer in the world in this moment in time, and I've got, five minutes later, I got nothing. What are, what are we going for? Your eye hasn't seen, your ear hasn't heard, your heart can't even comprehend the prize that's waiting for us in Christ Jesus. That's the prize. Something that we can't even comprehend, no matter how much we think about it. We don't even understand the amazingness that's waiting for us on the other side. We don't even understand what, what's, what's coming. And so we, have, we need to have this determination that whatever that prize is, I'm going to win. I mean, you talk about basketball today. There was the one guy carried the team. Everybody had a terrible day, except the one guy. Durant. And he carried the... He's, he pretty much said, I don't care what any of you guys are doing in this game. I'm going to win this game. I want the prize, is what he said. And I, you know, the other guy for the other team did that in the first game, and he didn't get the prize because his teammates, he couldn't overcome the failures of the teammates. But that's what it is. This is a race, an individual race. Do you want the prize? Because if you want the prize, you're going to run the race. And so he says we need to press on, we need to run the race. And so we see the first four things. What is the first one? That we're not satisfied. The second one is we have devotion to God. The third one is we're going in the correct direction. The fourth one is we have a determination to win. That we're going to go after this prize no matter what it takes. And now we get to the fifth one. All of those things, how did Durant get to where he is, Troy? Oh, continually practicing <coughs> what he does. Continually practicing. Now, what kind of practice, though? Well, his deals with repetitive, I um, mean, living the life every day of basketball, shooting. So it has to, it has, so he's not getting to where he is by throwing a football around. No, no, he's doing that, doing what he loves and what he's paid to do and what he wants to do, what he lives for. So what has, so his life is a life of discipline. And dedication. That he knows, all right, if I want to win that prize, I need to be ready to run the race. Look at what it says right here. Let those of us who are mature. Do you know that word mature right there? It says, because this is the last point. If we're going to live for the Lord in the, in the present, we need to be disciplined. The idea here, let those of us who are mature, the idea here is, can be translated because he's talking about sports. He's saying, let those of us who are in training. Or let those of us who are ready to compete, let those of us who have disciplined ourselves so we're ready to go into the game, let's have this mind. Are you ready to go into the game? Are you ready to compete wherever it is that you're at? Because that's part of what it takes to be a Christian. It takes disciplining ourselves to say, I'm going to discipline my body. I'm going to discipline myself physically and spiritually, to be ready for whatever it is the Lord is going to put in front of me. We just had a situation in church. I had, these guys went to, to talk to some other guys. And they came and said, I have to go talk to this other guy. And I told them, well, have you been reading your Bible? No. And I said, this is a sad day because you have to go talk to this guy. And the only way you're going to be able to talk to this guy is if you give him the truth of God's word and you're not ready. You hadn't trained yourself for this moment. And now you've entered into a big moment that's going to take, take some discipline for you to bring the truth into somebody's life. And you're, you, you're not ready. You don't have the word of God to impart into this guy's life. You're, you haven't been in training. You're not ready to go into the game. Can you imagine if Kevin Durant came and he was like, well, you know, last night I just I had like seven pizzas and 15 soda pops. I stayed up all night. I mean, right. you're not ready. Didn't shoot a ball for two weeks. Uh, You're not taking ready. a break, yeah. I'm taking a break. <laughs> He's not going to be able to go out there and compete at the level that he competed at. If you go in the game, you don't want to embarrass yourself. Don't embarrass yourself. Be ready for what's going on. We need discipline. So look at what he says. We need discipline. We need to be in training. We need to be ready for the contest. We need to think this way. And what is this way? This way is all of these essentials for Christian living. We need to be the ones examining ourselves, not content where we're at. We need to have devotion to God. We need to be sitting there with direction. We need to have determination. We need to be disciplining ourselves, dedicating ourselves. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. God's going to show you when you're on the wrong path. That's what this verse is talking about right here. God shows you when you're on the wrong path. Christians don't just go on the wrong path and be like, well, I, you know, I didn't know. No, you knew. You just decided to go do that. 
You know what's... I mean, Amen for that. I know that. As an athlete, you know what you need to put in your body. Or right? what not to. Or what not to put in your body. <laughs> Somebody comes up to you and offers you a performance-enhancing substance, you know there's consequences for taking mm -hmm. that. I was actually thinking more along the lines of excessive amounts of sugar. You know that you can't have excessive amounts of sugar if you're going to be an athlete. You know it's not going to be beneficial for what you're doing. Just like as Christians, we know the Lord convicts us. He shows us when we've gone down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. He's, he uses many different things. He uses the Word. He uses friends. He uses brothers. He uses spouses. Sometimes He uses children. The church even neighbors. Sometimes he'll use the police, right? <laughs> Say, you are speeding. Here's a ticket. Enjoy paying your fine. Fun time. Those are not fun times, Troy. Just telling you right now. So what do we need to do? Look, look at what he said. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Our doctrine leads to action. We need to hold on to the things that we know are true. The doctrine that we know leads to action. I mean, Wes Bentley was just amazing on Sunday because he talked about this very clearly. He says, you need to hold on to what is true. If the Lord Jesus has changed your life, there needs to be a difference. Yeah. You cannot look like the world. That's what he said. That's what this verse right here is talking about. You can't turn back. There needs to be a radical difference between you and the world. Notice what he says. Look at, uh, look at this. Look at this. He says, hold true to what you have attained. Luke 9, 61 and 62. It says something in Luke 9, 60. I'm not going to even ask you. Your, your pages are sticky. It's due to the humidity, not because my hands are gross. Luke 9 what? 61 and 62. Oh, you got it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say for to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hands in the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. What he's saying right there is, let me follow you, but let me stay in the world. Jesus responds to that guy and says, Hey, you want to follow me? Nobody puts his hand to the plow and turns back. Nobody puts his hand to the plow and says, Oh, I want to go back to the world. That's what Wes Bentley was talking about on, on Sunday yeah. morning. Nobody is going to do that. Yeah. Jesus says, You can't do that. Can't do that. You have to be different. And so right here what we see is that we have to be different. We have to finish the race strong. What happens if in the last quarter you're like, well, I'm, you know, I played good for three quarters. I'm going to be done now. You're going to win the game? You're not going to win the game because somebody's going to step up. I think when you mentioned West Valley too, I think you talked about that when they sit down for like breakfast, him and his pastors, he goes, we're not talking about football scores, yeah. baseball scores. Yeah. We're talking about what can we do? How can we progress? Yeah. How can we go forward? He goes, it's yeah. just a mindset. It's just... You know, they talked about death and all this stuff, what they're heading goes, but they weren't afraid of it. But you know, we weren't talking about, oh, we're going to do this, and you know, it's for lunch, what's for dinner, and it's all about direction. How can we protect the women and children? That's right. How can we do the important things that are in life? I mean, but that's what this verse is talking about. Their perspective about. is, like, right on, though. Like, they know that their time is short. They know they're going to die. Like, how much more if we have that perspective, you know? Like, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's what we see right here. We see right here that as Christians, because we, we're now leaving the present and we're starting to look to the future, that as Christians we need to have this attitude of looking to the future. You're going to have one attitude. You're either going to look to the future or you're going to look to the now. Because look at what he says. He says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have seen in us. What he's saying is, he's saying, hey, you think that you can't live this life. You think it's impossible. He says, not only is it, not only is that a lie from the enemy, mm -hmm. I'm living this life. So I know it's possible. And it's not just me, but there's others like me that are living this life. So we need to walk according to the example that Paul has said. We need to walk according to the example that those godly men, godly women that are in this culture and time that they're walking in. We need to walk and look at that example and say, okay, we're going to walk like that. That's what we're going to do. Because... The reality is what you believe determines how you behave. What you really believe determines your behavior as you go through life. Titus, if you turn over like three pages, four pages, eight pages, Titus 1.16 says something. What does Titus 1.16 say? Titus 1.16 says something pretty scary. Wait, it's not 
three peaches? What are you talking about? You're going the wrong. Oh way. yeah. <laughs> Titus, which one? Chapter. Gerald, you got it. Titus one sixteen. <laughs> one sixteen. They profess to know God, but right, works they deny Him, being an abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. They profess to know God, but mm -hmm. in the works they deny Him. Ooh. Talk about heavy that Paul lays on us here at the end of this. He's saying, hey guys, you gotta follow this example. Because there's people that talk about this example. Hey, Paul, lifestyle, great, yeah, live the Christian life, authentic. They have all the buzzwords, all the keywords. But then you look at their life. Yeah. Examine their life. That's what that's what Paul says here. Examine my life, guys. Examine it. Because if there's something wrong, tell me, because I, I don't want there to be something wrong. I have a goal. I have an aim because there's people that don't have that goal and have that aim. Look at what he says. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. There's people that Paul says, I have tears when I talk about these people. They're walking as enemies of the cross of Christ. I'm weeping for these guys. They're enemies. How do they walk? He's going to give you a couple things. He starts with their end. Their end is destruction. The idea right here, their end is they live a wasted life. That's the idea of this thought right here. Their life is waste. Can you imagine that? None of us, all of us want to live a life of meaning mm -hmm. and be effective. Mm -hmm. Paul says, hey, you living for yourself? Your life is wasted. The end is destruction. You're, I know where you're going. I've seen where you're going. Your end is destruction. It's all a waste. They're the hypocrites. They're the ones that talk and don't do. And not only don't do, but they're doing the exact opposite of the things that they say are important. What is the next one? Look at look at what he says here. You understand what is their God is their belly. And when you read that, you say, well, oh, so they're worshiping food. That's not what Paul is saying. <laughs> Listen very carefully to what Paul is saying. Paul is saying their God is their appetites. Oh. All right? Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is that their appetites of the flesh are driving everything that they do. The appetite, whether the appetite, the appetite could be food. The appetite could be winning a lot of money. The appetite could be any number of different things. But the reality, Paul says, their end is going to be a waste. Their God, what they're following is their own selfish desires. Their flesh. That's what they're following. Their God is their, their appetites will dictate their lifestyle. They don't live a disciplined lifestyle. They're following every single woman. If they, they want seven pizzas, they're going to have seven pizzas. They don't want to shoot the ball for two weeks, they're not going to shoot the ball for two weeks. They don't want to protect the women and children, eh, somebody else is going to do it. I don't need to do it. I don't want to die. Their appetites dictate their lifestyle. And then look at the third one. They glory in their shame. What does that mean? That This is very, very scary. Because this one means this. This one means that they justify the things that they should be condemning. They're saying it's okay. The sin that you're doing, oh, it's okay. Tony, you know, just pray a little prayer, Troy. It's yeah, totally... Don't bother nobody else. Just, just pray a little yeah. prayer. <clears throat> Look for me, Isaiah 5.20. What does Isaiah 5.20 say about this? <coughs> Isaiah 5.20 is a really, this is one of Maddie's favorite verses. You can go tell her, Maddie, we read, when she comes back, mm -hmm. you can go tell her we read one of her favorite verses. Isaiah 5.20, what does it say? Rena's looking at me like she wants to read it. Go ahead, Rena. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Hmm. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. You look at that, who put darkness for light. They're calling the darkness, oh, that darkness that you're in, that's really light. Look at what they say. They're calling light dark. They put bitter for sweet. That bitter that, that I'm giving you, no, that's really sweet. I mean, he gives you a bunch of examples as you go through that. They're wise in their own eyes. They're shrewd in their own sight. They're heroes. Look at what he says. They're heroes at drinking wine. They're valiant men at mixing strong drink who acquit the guilty for a bribe. I, we see that. Yeah all the time in our culture. Yeah. They just got rid of that judge oh, that in, yeah. in California. They got rid of that judge that that 
Gave the guy six gave months the guy for six rape. Gave the guy six months for raping someone. Because he, he was a star swimmer at Stanford. Oh I know, that was gosh. ridiculous. That was and absolutely now ridiculous. A, now there's other people that are up in arms for getting him out of, for recalling him. Because they say, well, you're just setting a dangerous precedent. No, he set a dangerous precedent. They wouldn't yeah. have had to do anything if he just did his job. Yeah. If he, I mean, if he didn't pervert justice. I'm not saying he took a bribe. But what I'm saying is he did he perverted justice. Yeah. Uh, everyone instinctively knows you rape somebody, you need to be in prison more than three months. Yeah. It was it was absolutely that ridiculous. That was ridiculous. That it, was... They deprived the innocent of his right. I mean, look at our look at our where our country is heading. We're we're depriving the innocent. We're making the innocent guilty. And so you look back at that and you say, this is happening in our time. Paul is writing this 2,000 years ago, guys. And you look at every one of these things. Do we see people whose gods, whose appetites are defining their lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Do you see that in our culture right now? Mm -hmm. How prevalent is it in America? Ooh. Every time you open the newspaper and read CNN, it's just insane. You, can't, you cannot escape this is what I'm trying to say. They glory in their shame. They justify the things that they should condemn. Mm -hmm. How often do you see that? Every time. You see it almost every moment of every day. And then what? Look at look at this last one right here. With minds set on earthly things. They have this mindset. It's all centered on earthly and human wisdom. It sounds great in their own minds. But Jesus says that path leads to destruction. Right? This is a, what Paul is... You know, so many people try to fit a certain group of sinners into this and say, well, he's really just talking about the Judaizers. He's really just talking about the Gnostics. He's really just... No! What Paul is giving you here, he's saying, this is gone on in time past, in time present, and it's going to go on in time future. And as we are in his future, 2,000 years later, we look at this and say, oh my gosh, Paul, what you wrote about 2,000 years ago is still happening, and even to a greater degree today. Mm -hmm. It's still going on now. It's a general warning that if you're living for yourself, watch out. Because he says, then you have to go all the way back to verse 12. Are you examining yourself? Are you satisfied with where you're at? Because if that's true, then this warning is for you. you gotta, you got to watch out and say, well, is this warning for me? Am I, is my appetite driving my lifestyle? Or is my lifestyle under discipline mm. of God where I'm disciplining myself both physically and spiritually for the task that God's put before me and now notice what Paul is going to say because this might be you want and you want to go up uh, I'm not gonna read it tonight Romans 1 18 through 32 gives us a beautiful picture of and as Paul writing again what what this really looks like of people exchanging God for an idol mm. you know it's just it's a terrible thing that goes on Verse 20 and 21, now he switches and he says, that's hypocrisy at its finest, and it's happening all around us. But you want to see authentic? Here's authentic. Authentic is this, but our citizenship is in heaven. You see what he's saying right there? If you are a citizen of heaven, how should you act? As a citizen of heaven. As a citizen of Rome back in the day, he's writing to the Philippians, which were a colony of Rome. They were citizens of Rome. They, If you were born in Philippi, you were on the rolls as being a Roman citizen. It was a colony of Rome. So you're a citizen of Rome. If you left Philippi, you're still a citizen of Rome. You're still on the roll as being a citizen. When Americans leave America, we're still citizens of what? America. <laughs> and that is, when I take people on missions, it's I tell them two things. I say, you don't, Americans, do they, they don't have a good reputation yeah. across the globe as being good representations of their country. Yeah. And I tell people when you go on mission trips, I say, there's two things. You have to understand this. One, you're represent, you are a citizen of heaven, you're representing the Lord. Everything that you do, good or bad, goes back to God. Yeah. You're representing him to the people that you're ministering to. Two, you're representing your country. Everything that you do here in this foreign country, you represent. They might not know that you're a citizen of heaven, but they do know for sure that you are a citizen of the United States of America. You are representing your country. Do not shame our country. I've been 
places. Troy's been places. You've seen Americans have a poor attitude in visiting other countries. We, we treat people pretty bad. We have a reputation almost. Yeah. What Paul is saying here is, he's saying, you have a reputation. You're a citizen of heaven. Live like a citizen of heaven. Live like where you belong. Wow. What an, now notice what he says. He says, your citizenship is in heaven. Live like a citizen of heaven. And from it we await what? For the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What is he saying with that statement? Do you see what he's saying with that statement? We await what? A Savior. What is he implying when he's saying, I'm waiting for a Savior? What does that mean? If I sat here in this room and said, I'm waiting for Troy, what is what would you all assume? Troy's coming. Where is Troy going to come? Through that door. And he's going to come sit right here. If I said right now, oh, Kenny texted, I'm waiting for Kenny. You know he's coming. Kenny's yeah. coming. Yeah. So when Paul is writing this, there are so many people that said, well, Paul wasn't expecting Jesus to return anytime soon. Paul's not expecting a rapture. Paul's not expecting the return of Christ. Paul's expecting the return of Christ. He says, I'm waiting for, I'm a citizen of a country, and I'm waiting for that king to come here. That, that king is coming he, for me. Eagerly. He's, he's excited about it. He's eagerly. He's talking about the hope of the future. He's saying, I'm waiting for the Savior. The Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is coming soon in Paul's thinking. And Paul says, this is the mind that we all have to have, that Jesus is coming soon. And what does he say? What's going to happen when Jesus comes? going to transform. Transform uh, us. I'm going to be transformed. Troy, I have great news for you. You're going to be transformed. Lorelai doesn't care as much. Leilani doesn't care as much. But you and I and Gerald, maybe Lorena a little bit. She has, she's I hasn't had turned much, 40 yet. I had to so she, she doesn't understand the pain of... <laughs> Any of these over 40 no, things that I'm, we understand. I'm half life right now. I understand it. But what happens after you turn 40? You start going downhill. I mean, we, we pray for your knee all the time. Yeah, and I'm picking up speed on the downhill, I tell you. It, it, it yeah. comes with increasing frequency and difficulty. But what does he say? He says, this body that I have to run five miles every day just to maintain... The level of fat that I'm at. <laughs> I can't even lose it running five miles a day. Before I could, now I can't. I go six. I gotta go six or eight now. Yes. Shut up. But what does he say? He's gonna transform this lowly body. What does he mean by lowly body? He just means the human body. The human body is gonna be transformed. How? Because we had an example of Jesus Christ, of him resurrected from the dead. Our body is gonna be like his body. We're going to have a glorious body. It's going to be, people are going to still know, oh, that's Troy, but Troy's going to have a new body. Yeah. They're going to know, oh, that's Eli, but Eli's going to have a new body. <laughs> Praise Jesus. That's, I'm looking forward to that. I, and I can't imagine Troy, I mean, I'm like, like, all right. Oh, yeah. You're not going to, there's no pain, yeah. there's no suffering. All that stuff is gone. We're going to be transformed. Why? How? By the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Here's our hope. That one day we're going to be transformed. That who, if there's one person that can transform us, who is it? It's God. Why? Because he has all power. He's not lacking in any power. He's like, well, I can do it for Jesus, but I can't do it for you. Sorry. No. He's doing it for us too. I'm going to be transformed. You're going to be transformed. We have this great hope. And so how do you end with that? I mean, we see, still see these threats going on, but we need to be authentic. I wrote this down. This is John Stott. He says this. He says, we belong to a far off homeland and wait for the king of that land to come. Each one of us, I belong, Lorena belongs, Gerald, Leilani, Lorelai, Troy, we belong to a far off homeland. And where's that far off homeland? We can't see it right now, but we know about it. We've read about it. John wrote about it. We know it's there. Jesus gave us the promise that he's going to prepare a place for him. And if it were not so, he would have told us. But don't worry, because he's going to come again. And so that where he is, there we may be also. We had that beautiful picture of Troy and Paz, where Troy had to go off to his father's house and prepare a room. And then he had to sneak in and come for Paz. And Paz was like so shocked, like, oh, he came, yay! And they go running off together. Well, they're married. Awesome. They're married. I, yeah. yeah. It was great. It was a good, it was a good indication but how it should be. It's, 
We're waiting for that king of the land to come, to fetch us. And this is what it says. Our names are on the citizenship roll. Our place, um, our place there is secure. Why were you secure as a Roman citizen? Because your name was on the citizen roll. Your name's not getting taken off the citizen roll. Your position is secure. But while we wait here, we need to live as if we were there. You go back to what we talked about, I think, last week, that we're ambassadors of Christ. Mm -hmm. What is an ambassador? Ambassador who knows where his homeland is and knows he's just here for a time. Just here for a time and for a purpose. To live for Christ and to point people to him. And so that's our challenge today. Live for Christ today. Don't be satisfied. Have devotion to the Lord. Um, go the same direction. Have determination. Discipline yourself. And then live as a citizen of heaven. Because that's what... Live what you are. Live as a citizen of heaven. So Father, we thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Paul writing these things that we can look at them and just be encouraged to live for you. Mm -hmm. And so help us as men and women to be living as citizens of heaven. To do those things that you would call us to do. So we trust these things to you. Uh, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.